So without further ado, I think we'll get started with the first segment. And we're very pleased to welcome in Dr. Isaiah Arkin, better known as Shy. And uh, to briefly give you a background about Shy, uh, Dr. Arkin is a professor of structural biochemistry at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and was the former vice president for research and development at the university. He holds a PhD from Yale School of Medicine in cell biology and his research has shed new light on the inner workings of flu viruses, in particular, how a virus avoids antiviral therapy. Welcome, Shai. Wonderful to be here, thanks a lot. So I think the best way to start uh, would be to just give us a little bit of a background, explain your expertise relative to the current coronavirus pandemic. Okay, so uh, once again, it's wonderful to be here. And let me start with a uh, strange note. Let me start with a disclaimer to tell you what I'm not. So first of all, I'm not a physician, nor am I an epidemiologist, and I'm also not a true virologist in the sense of the word. And the reason that you're talking to me is because I'm a relatively strange and unique scientist, because I'm one of those people that actually studied coronaviruses before December of 2019. <laughs> So I'm a biochemist that studies viruses, mainly how they maintain their salinity and acidity. And I've been focusing on two viruses, influenza and SARS from 2003. And uh, I find that all of the information that I've accumulated in the last two decades, which was esoteric up until December of 2019, is suddenly uh, in the limelight. So that's why I'm very happy to be able to contribute and to shed as much information and light that I have on this important topic. So with that in mind, and certainly thinking back to some of the other coronaviruses that you mentioned, I think a question we hear a lot about on the news here lately is, is the COVID-19 mutating into different strains? And what might that mean as we uh, try to tackle this virus? So the very short answer is yes. But when we mean different strains, we should immediately specify, does it mean that we will need to come up with a different sort of remedy for each and every one of those strains? I think the answer to that is currently, we haven't seen any. So we haven't seen any uh, generation of dramatically different strains that will require a different uh, procedure in order to combat. Now, the reason that these viruses are mutating so rapidly into different strains is because their genomic information is based on a single strand of RNA. Ours is based on two strands of DNA, which are looped together. So these viruses have a different evolutionary strategy. Their strategy is changed dramatically and quickly in order to avoid everything that we throw at them. Having said that, they still change slower than the flu. So again, if I were a betting man, and this is what's called at these times, uh, I would follow the giant's uh, you know, shoulders of Peter Doherty, Nobel Prize winner, that says that you know, if you got the, the COVID-19 this year, you're probably going to be immune from it in later attacks. So if you're going to be immune for it in further attacks, then it becomes imperative for us to tackle and deal with the virus as it is now. So what do you think the most effective routes are going to be in order to deal with this particular virus? So when we speak about routes, we need to specify both the mechanism and the time span. So if we divide that into short term, medium, long term, and the very long term, I would say short term, the best thing that we can try to do is to repurpose current drugs. And by that, I mean drugs that are already been approved for human use against one particular disease can be then used off-label, off-target, repurposed is the technical word against this particular virus. And we've already seen an example of uh, hydroxychloroquine. And probably when we start working more intensively on this, we'll probably find more. Medium long term, probably vaccine is uh, the best route to go. Uh, unfortunately, that's probably not going to be in place in the very few months, but I think it's going to be uh, 
optimistically likely to happen within a year. And long term, I would probably say that we're going to be seeing uh, the development of new drugs, you know, the Tamiflu's against coronaviruses. But that's you're talking about years. So again, the most important thing that we need to do is to work on all of these avenues at the same time, because you never know, unfortunately, in research, which one of these is going to pan out. So very short term repurposing, medium long term vaccines, very long term new drug development. Let, let me ask you to follow up on that. Uh, you, you mentioned kind of that medium term, and I think you referenced a year or just over a year. Right. What are some of the things that would have to happen for us to meet that timeline? for us to have a new vaccine within a year? So the important thing to say with respect to vaccine development is that once again, the scientific community can't look at this virus and say, ah, there is a really big stumbling block here that's gonna prevent us from generating a vaccine. There's nothing inherently complicated. For example, HIV, the causative agent of AIDS, attacks our immune system. And that's why so far we have been uh, unable to generate vaccines against HIV. But here we need to remember that coronaviruses have been causing havoc for uh, you know, animals and uh, things that we uh, grow agriculturally. And we were able to develop vaccines against coronaviruses that attack animals. So I think there's nothing to prevent us from pursuing vaccine development in a standard route. But again, efficacy and toxicity and to ensure that this generates a proper immune response, these things take, take months. And I, I, again, it, would be, it wouldn't be unrealistic for us to expect that within a year, we're going to have a very good vaccine on the market. Um, when, when, you talk, when, when you talk about standard routines or standard uh, procedures from that timeline, are you factoring in the loosening of regulations that we've seen or at least heard politicians talking about because of the crisis? Or are you saying that that actually could move that timeline up from a standard timetable? I would be hesitant to use the term loosening of regulations. I would um, like to use different sort of terms of concentrating an effort and focus. Uh, for example, if you were to come up with a uh, medication today, you would be put in a queue in the FDA because there are probably other medications there that are being evaluated. I would imagine that right now, if you came up with a solution to COVID-19, you would immediately be bumped to the head of the queue and rightfully so. So I don't think that uh, when, and again, I don't say if, I'm confident that we are in the when realm, when something comes to the market, the safety will be compromised simply because we're doing this in haste. I think a concentrated effort and a focus and a willingness to help on the part of the FDA will ensure that we get the most rapid response that we can get. So some of the ways that we're uh, able to get that rapid response is because we have more innovative technology today uh, than we've had in previous outbreaks. For you personally, are you using any of that innovative technology to aid research or to aid your own research? Well, first of all, I would say as an Israeli, I have to, because uh, <laughs> you know, we, we can't just use brute force. Uh, we're using a completely, my lab is using a completely different approach. We are targeting a component in the virus that others are not focusing on, and we're using a completely different way to go about inhibiting it. And I think that what we need to do here is to try lots of different things. Because again, research by its very nature is not a course in which you have an assured uh, outcome at the end. There's not a timeline, okay, we passed the six months timeline, we're gonna get a result. No, that's not necessarily the case. So I think having lots of labs around the world working on this, each using their particular rationale is the way to ensure that you get a response. And again, we need to remember that uh, the developed world has not seen an infectious agent that it couldn't uh, annihilate. And uh, perhaps that's why we became complacent in all honesty. But if you look at it, you know, things that have been incredibly crafty, if it's HIV, hepatitis C, so many different infectious agents, 
we were able to come up with an answer to each and every one of them. And the only reason that we don't have an answer right now is because we were not posed a question up until December of 2019. So from December of 2019, fast forwarding to a couple of days ago at the end of March 2020, uh, Dr. Fauci has become quite uh, quite well known, quite recognizable. Oh, yeah. Um, but he said that he believed that United States deaths alone could reach or top 200,000. I think senior administration officials even said as high as 240,000. Given the size of the United States and given what you just said about being able to tackle uh, tackle these diseases in the past, uh, do those numbers sound right to you? Does, does, do those numbers make sense? So first of all, I have to say that, uh, formally speaking, could reach, the, on, the obvious answer is correct. Yes, they could. The question that should be posed is, are they likely to reach that? Okay, because, you know, worst case scenario is, uh, it is very easy to, uh, to sort of hedge your bets on that. But are they likely? So right now, America has uh, about 22 uh, I'm sorry, 220,000 uh, cases with about 5,000 mortalities. And by that, you reach a uh, mortality rate of two and a quarter percent. So in order to have more than 200,000 people die, you would have to have 8 million cases. Now, in all honesty, that sounds somewhat unrealistic. And the reason for that is that while, yes, it is true to say that the U.S. is still in the rapid exponential growth phase, uh, and it's also true to say that the uh, mortality rate will unfortunately increase once the number of cases increase because the taxation on the health system would be much larger. But there are so many things that are working in your favor. Obviously, one of them is the weather. It's getting warmer, and it is true to say that other places in the world in which it's warmer, this has not been so dreadful. Uh, social distancing has not been enforced in such a way. So uh, I think it's an unlikely scenario. Pro a probable? Of course, everything is probable. Likely? I don't think so. I want to I want to ask a follow up on two things you just said, um, because we don't have those in, for, in future questions. You talked about the weather. The weather was one of the items that came out right from the start, uh, even as this was contained largely to Asia, uh, that it would dramatically offset what would happen in the United States. You referenced that it is true to say that that has an impact on viruses. So maybe just expand a little bit about what you think the impact will have on this coronavirus as the weather starts to rapidly get warmer here in North America. So when you look at the, uh, there is a flu season that we're familiar with. And the flu season, uh, you know, the disease abates dramatically come spring, uh, and especially when the summer comes. And for example, flu season in Australia hits its peak around uh, August. So uh, the heat is not conducive to the spread of respiratory diseases. Now, when you look, for example, at Australia, which does have a few cases, although the disease there has been diminishing, you actually see that the hotter places have lower uh, contagiousness. So again, this is not certain. Uh, we're basing this premise on what happened with SARS in 2003. We're basing this on other widespread respiratory diseases such as influenza. But I think it is clear to say that, you know, heating up is working uh, uh, dramatically at your favor. So uh, I'm going to skip a question and then build on what you just said, because I think that that's okay. really interesting. You referenced the Southern Hemisphere and right. uh, we were going to uh, we were going to talk about what has is starting to become known as the third wave, if you will. Right. So the third, certainly we had, uh, we had Asia, we've seen it now across Europe and the United States, but this quote unquote third wave, uh, as the Southern hemisphere is the opposite in that it's now heading towards winter, where right. we're more worried about the virus, the flu season that you mentioned. So what, uh, what do we expect? And from your history as a, a focusing on the spread of these viruses, 
what should the Southern Hemisphere be expecting now as it has a much more difficult calendar in front of it? That's actually one of the biggest questions out there right now. So if you look at places such as Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, the disease really, uh, I wouldn't say it's disappeared, but it's dramatically abating. The number of new cases is reducing every day. Brazil has about 7,000 cases and 250 deaths. I, once again, am a bit optimistic because I would say that they have learned from the lessons of the tremendous benefits of social distancing that uh, have experienced on uh, you know, those places that were able to combat this disease. And I think that if they employ those, I think they'll be able to combat it more effectively. So I'm, I'm, I don't think that we're going to see the same death toll. But uh, again, these are very, very different, uh, difficult p predictions to make. And as, as they have arguably a little bit more time to prepare, do you think that they will be earlier in the game for social distancing? You referenced social distancing and the very uneven application of that policy, right. even across different jurisdictions here in the United States, let alone around different parts of the world. We've seen uh, Japan has, a, for example, has a, a much more difficult time based on how its government is set up. Uh, different parts of the United States, it's unclear as to which layer of government or what level has that ability. What do you think for those countries that have more time or have had more of a heads up, such as those in the Southern Hemisphere, relative to social distancing? Well, one would hope that they would uh, utilize the uh, painful lessons that were learned by places that did not employ this policy uh, in order to uh, ensure that they do have that. Another thing that they, are, they have working in their favor is that right now the supportive care that is provided, you know, ventilation machines, etc., one can shift them from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere once the disease shifts focus. So I would hope again that those areas would be better prepared for what's coming because they've seen the uh, dreadful rehearsal that has taken place. Some of the uh, some of some of the commentary about the pandemic is really around: Is this the beginning of the new normal? Is is humanity going to be faced with pandemics, with outbreaks, even with viruses, very specifically, more often in the future, based on? Uh, just the way that the world has been changing. Do you think that that is, as you, to use your own words, likely versus probable? Or do you think that this is an exception uh, and that this is going to be the wake-up call that the world needs to prevent this from happening more often? So obviously the, the world population is increasing. Urbanization isn't helping. Globalization isn't helping as well. Uh, but I would say that we really have been complacent about uh, the threat that infectious diseases pose us. In the United States, for example, the most uh, dangerous infectious disease that exacts the largest amount of mortality is the flu. And the flu is very often scoffed upon as, you know, something that, okay, it uh, puts you in bed for a few days, but that's it. And most of the resources has have been spent, perhaps rightfully so, on things like cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, etc. I think this is a wake-up call, and governments will place more focus on understanding diseases that are currently prevalent in animals, because those are the diseases that are going to jump to us, zoonotic diseases. So I don't think that this is going to be a, a an example of things to come. I think that once we've gotten this slap in the uh, face. Uh, this is a very rude wake-up call. I think they're going to be so much better prepared for what's next. And I'm not fearful that this is going to be a, a standard uh, thing that we are going to need to learn how to live with. What, I mean, you talked about, you know, some of the realities that we're faced with in the wake-up calls. What, uh, what, what role do you think cultural norms 
have begun to play into this in the sense that we often glamorize or even heroically worship those who have worked while sick or able to overcome it or whether it's our athletic uh, stories of athletes playing sick or people coming to work and fighting through or uh, people still making trips. We've, we've almost glorified uh, fighting through illness and not taking time away. Uh, what role do you think that has had? And, and is that one of those aspects that you think will be a wake up call? Or do you think that that's much more difficult because it's been ingrained in our societal norms? Well, I would hope that, again, we haven't encountered anything as infectious that in this in quite some time. So one would hope that images of uh, amazing athletes that we all endure. I mean, we all remember the story of Michael Jordan playing playoff games when he had a tremendous fever and scoring a huge number of points. And again, that was heroic. Uh, but I think that today, having all, having a worldwide lockdown, each of us remembers vividly, what does it mean to be infected by someone? It's probably going to, uh, you know, have those sort of feelings tapered dramatically. And again, I, I refer back to my disclaimer, I'm a biochemist, <laughs> maybe psychologists and sociologists are going to be better prepared to answer those questions. Well, let's, let's ask you one, one more unfair one, perhaps the, the question, okay. the next question is really about the global policymakers. So not that, so stepping away from the cultural side, how about the policymaker side? What do you think that this is going to teach our policymakers about healthcare, both from an individual country by country basis, but also as a global community? Well, first, uh, you know, we're all connected is not just a slogan. Uh, we are all connected and we have seen this Despite the fact that the disease takes place in a different continent, you can just, you know, look at your watch and realize it's coming your way. Second, I think that the idea that we have that uh, due to antibiotics, due to vaccinations, you know, we've really gotten rid of infectious diseases. Yes, we have made amazing strides uh, combating infectious diseases, some dreadful diseases such as polio in smallpox are really a thing of the past. But, you know, they are not a thing of the past as a category, infectious diseases. And I think it doesn't take a huge amount of resource diversion in order to ensure that we are far better prepared. So once again, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic that this is probably not gonna be the norm. This is not gonna be the routine and the scientific community and policymakers are going to ensure that this is uh, going to be beyond us, hopefully, in the very near future. So to wrap it up, uh, we'll take the, the last question that we have is building on that idea of the norm. And it's perhaps an unfair question, uh, one very much open to interpretation. But when do you believe that we will be back to normal? And whatever normal now means, when will people, when will this be past us? Okay, I mean, I, I can always repeat the quote that I had with Kathy that, uh, that I use in such instances that prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Maybe in our <laughs> part of the world, we say that since the destruction of the second temple, prophecy has been left to the fools. But, you know, if you're really pushing me, I would say that I would be astonished that, that we're going to be in the same state in a few months from now. Fantastic. I think we're well, talking about enough. a few months, not a few weeks, and not a year or more. So somewhere in between. Well, I have really uh, enjoyed this conversation, Shai. I really thank you coming to us all the way from Israel uh, live and shows what technology can do. Uh, again, for those of you who joined us late, uh, Professor and Dr. Arkin, the Professor of Structural Biochemistry at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Thank you very much, Guy. I hope that everybody there uh, and all of your family is safe and healthy, and we very much look forward to speaking with you soon. Likewise. Be well, everyone. And again, upwards and onwards. Thank you.